episode of this mini-series, we went through the development of the Soviet aircraft carriers that was followed by the West with increasing concern, but it was shaped by a mission and a doctrine different from the American and the Western in general. In the second and final episode, if you stay with me till the end, we will see how and why it developed so differently why the Western concern was not justified and why the legacy of the Soviet design has been passed on to the developing countries. At the end of the 70s, the Soviet Navy was building the last of the Kiev-class carriers. It was considered a great improvement over the Moskva and it did expand the capabilities of the Soviet surface groups. However, the Kiev could have been considered light carriers according to the Western standards. As the British demonstrated at the Falklands, a light carrier is much better than no carrier, so the NATO fleets were concerned about the progressive improvement of the Soviet naval aviation. What some NATO analysts failed to realize at the time was that this improvement had to be put in a perspective totally different from the American perspective. The Americans and the NATO valued the carriers as weapons capable of exerting control over a large area of the ocean and project air power against ground targets. The Soviets didn't really care. They didn't care because their mission was to stop the naval traffic in the North Atlantic carrying reinforcement to Europe. They did not need a carrier group for that at all. At the beginning of the 80s, the Soviet fleet had the capabilities required for the mission of closing the Atlantic and they were based on three pillars. The submarines, actually hundreds of them. The surface groups armed with long-range surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And finally, the nightmare of the NATO commanders, the land-based naval aviation. Hundreds of Tupolev 22M backfire based on the Kola Peninsula and in the Far East were the most fearsome weapons of the Soviet naval aviation. The backfires had a range of thousands of kilometers, they could sprint at Mach 2 to launch the weapons or escape the fighters, and they could carry two or three almost hypersonic, long range, large and heavy missiles. This force could easily saturate the defenses of a battle group. The Soviets were conscious that an American carrier group was a formidable opponent, capable of inflicting and absorbing a large amount of damage. But the Americans were also conscious that the cornerstone of their naval power could be rendered useless in an afternoon by just a couple of AS-4 missiles hitting the carrier. The F-14 Tomcat, the Phoenix missile, the Aegis system and the SM-2 missiles were all different ways to counter this menace. So the Soviets did not need conventional carrier groups to close the Atlantic, they already had what they needed. What they were in search for though was a way to improve the effectiveness of their weapons. While it is true that the Soviet Navy in the 70s was still toying with the idea of a design similar to the American carriers, they end up settling for an evolutionary design based on a stobar configuration because, at the end, they recognized that it was everything that was needed. The design of the Riga-class carriers was considered an incremental development from the Kiev. The ships are a bit larger than the Kiev and they have a sky jump rather than catapults. This design, as we already said, imposes quite severe limitation to the payload of the planes taking off, but it was not perceived as a particular problem. The mission of the ship was just to provide air cover. The naval version of the Sukhoi 27 planned to be used on board of this vessel, which, that is the Sukhoi 33, operated exclusively with an air-to-air -air payload, usually lighter than the anti-ship or the air-to-ground typical payload. The operational concept behind the use of the carriers was twofold. In the context of a surface group armed with long-range anti-ship missiles, the carrier was supposed to provide air cover. Since the main surface weapon the NATO was going to use against the group was the air power, 
then providing air coverage to the group itself was going to entirely make sense. The group offensive weapons were the missiles, not the planes, and that was the reason why the carrier featured surface-to-surface -surface missiles to add to those of the group. A surface group with fixed-wing air cover was a much more hardened target for the American naval aviation. However, the Soviet carriers were supposed to have another purpose as a force multiplier. Since the contrast of the Soviet land-based naval aviation was still a task for the American carrier air wing, the fighters on uh, a Soviet carrier also had the purpose to distract the American fighters from the bombers. Luckily, this never happened, but it is safe to suppose that the Tomcat launched to intercept a Tupolev 95 maritime reconnaissance plane or a, a regiment of Tupolev 22M would be distracted a lot by its target if attacked by a Sukhoi 33. The embarked planes would have acted as escorts for the bombers. The reason why land-based fighters were not really a feasible option was that the range of the backfire was two or three times the range of every operational fighter and the amount of air refueling assets that would have been necessary would have greatly increased the complexity and the vulnerability of the whole force. Then, the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s turned all these plans into nothing. The Indian Navy is a blue water navy, a navy that is equipped to operate in the ocean far away from its own bases and from land based air cover. In fact, the Indian naval doctrine predicates the sea control over the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal and beyond. India is a maritime country because the vast majority of its foreign exchanges happen by ship. The Indian Navy exists primarily to preserve these commercial routes if and when this will be necessary, but also to defend the maritime borders of India and to be a deterrent for any potential threat. The original plan for the 21st century was to deploy three carrier battle groups, one for each continental side, with one in reserve or refitting. Aircraft carriers are the cornerstone of a blue water navy because the embarked aircraft can patrol an area much larger than the surface ships. Also, the carriers can project air power on the sea over land up to a certain depth and they can provide air cover to amphibious landings. In general, they provide a decisive advantage over those who do not have a carrier. India operated a cattlebar ship and a light carrier in the past, but second-hand British designs modified quite heavily for Indian news. When it was time to replace the Virat in the early 2000s, there were no more second-hand Western ships readily available. Actually, India has a long-term policy to become as independent as possible in defense equipment, so a program for an indigenous carrier was actually started in 2004. In the meanwhile, India was in search of a shorter term replacement and there was an option that just seemed a no-brainer. The ex-Soviet Kiev-class Baku carrier was mothballed waiting to learn its destiny. When India signed a contract to acquire the ship, it was only 11 years old, eight of which spent in reserve. The carrier was free, but the reactivation and the updates asked by the Indians were priced at less than a billion dollars which is a very cheap price for a carrier. The acquisition though turned out to be a nightmare. Costs ballooned, delays mounted, and the ship was finally commissioned only in 2014. The ship delivered, however, was a different design than the Kiev. The entire boat third of the ship had been removed and replaced with a new section of the flight deck with a rather tall sky jump. So India, despite commissioning an entirely new ship, had chosen a Stobar configuration. We have already seen that a configuration like this penalizes the maximum takeoff weight. Uh, the actual penalty varies depending on various factors, but to give an order of magnitude, the maximum takeoff weight may be reduced roughly by 35% in a Stobar configuration. Additionally, some planes that do not have a fighter jet acceleration can't physically take off from a sky jump, like the airborne early warning planes or the transport planes. 
this penalty was not a key factor for the Soviet Union since their doctrine was to use the planes just for air-to-air -air operations or reconnaissance at most. But India wants to use its carrier groups for sea control. The answer to this conundrum came in the form of the MiG-29K. While the Soviet and the Russian Navy had chosen the Sukhoi-33, a variant of the Sukhoi-27 optimized for air-to-air -air carrier operations, the MiG Bureau developed on its own initiative the MiG-29K, a variant of the MiG-29 modified for carrier use and capable of using air-to-ground and anti-ship weapons. Turning a land-based design into a carrier-based is not easy. The first problem is that the undercarriage and the structure must be strengthened. Tile hook need to be added, and the anti-corrosion measures must be much more effective to withstand the effect of salt water. To compensate the added weight and put up with a very short takeoff run, a maximum of 195 meters, but it can be as short as 95, then the engines were upgraded to provide about 7% more thrust, the wings had their surface increased, and a folding mechanism was added. For storage, obviously. The maximum payload, though, is just 5.5 tons, and I expect that, in practice, a good portion of it needs to be sacrificed for the range. However, with the MiG-29K, it was possible to operate a supersonic multi-role fighter adequate for the level of the threat the Indians may face, albeit with some limitation. The ship is reported to operate with an air wing of 24 jets and 10 helicopters of various types, good enough to establish the air superiority and exert the sea control. This is not the end of the story though, because the Indian indigenously built Vikrant aircraft carrier is expected to enter service in 2023, according to the latest news, and it is again a Stober design. The MiG-29K will fly from the new carrier and maybe a naval version of the Tejas. However, it seems that the Indian Navy is also considering the naval version of the Rafale, which would make sense considering that the Air Force is already introducing it, even if the Rafale M is designed for the catapult. In the last couple of decades, the Chinese Navy has steadily grown under a process that clearly aims for the stars. From a coastal defensive service, it turned into an offensive-minded force designed to be part of the process to gain control of the first chain of islands off the Chinese coast, if a conflict should start. According to the official documents, the Chinese are planning a fleet of six carrier groups, in groups of two, each operating in a separate theater, north, central, and south. However, while India had a small but consolidated naval aviation tradition, China had none. China in the 90s purchased two of the surviving Soviet Kiev ships, using them as attraction in amusement parks or turning them into luxury hotels. So it was not suspicious when a Chinese businessman offered to purchase from the Ukraine the unfinished Variag, the second and never finished Riga class Stobar aircraft carrier. The story of the purchase and the delivery would be amazing in itself, but what matters for our analysis is that the ship that arrived in Dalian in 2002 and in 2005 the refitting operation was started. The Chinese shipbuilding industry had already acquired the technical expertise to complete the ship and in 2011 rebuilt and updated it started the sea trials under the name Liaoning. And if the Chinese had the competency to rebuild the ship relatively quickly, building a naval aviation was a totally different matter. The Liaoning air wing is composed by 24 J-15 fighters and a dozen helicopters of various kind. The J-15 is a derivation from the J-11, in turn derived from the Russian Sukhoi-27, and it was augmented with the reverse engineering of Sukhoi-33 prototype, acquired in circumstances not entirely clear from Ukraine. There has been friction between Russia and China on this subject of reverse engineering, but still the Chinese are one of the best Russian customers, so yeah. 
Even if the J-15 turned out to be a workable interim solution, building a naval aviation requires a set of institutional experience and tradition that may require decades if built from scratch. After all, the Soviets started in the mid-50s and by the late 80s they still did not develop the same proficiency of the United States, France or the UK. So the Chinese asked for help in a really surprising place. Brazil. The Brazilian Navy in fact successfully operated Catobar carriers since the 60s, acquired from the UK and France, and it is still operating an ex-British light carrier today. So the Brazilians trained the first generation of naval aviation sailors for the Chinese Navy. The Liaoning for quite a few years was designed as a training ship while the Navy was trying to form an experienced corps of personnel capable of training the next generation and support the further expansion already planned. And the expansion is already ongoing with the second aircraft carrier, the Shandong, being commissioned in December 2019. It took about six years to build it from scratch as an improved and slightly larger version of the Liaoning. Western analysts believe that the two ships will still work relentlessly to train pilots and other personnel while achieving some level of operational capability. This capability can only be considered similar to the original Soviet idea of providing air cover to surface groups and fighter escorts to land-based planes. The two ships are known as the Type 001 and Type 002, but there is a Type 003 already in the making and its commissioning is expected to happen around 2023. In this case, it will be definitely a step up. In fact, the carrier being built is expected to be around 85,000 tons, almost twice as much as the two previous ships. It will have a catabar configuration with electromagnetic catapults, albeit the propulsion won't be nuclear. Even the carrier wing is expected to be different with naval versions of the most recent Chinese fighters like the J-20 or the J-31 and other complements like air refueling and early warning platforms, like in an American or a French carrier group. And the Type 003 is not the end, since there are already news of a Type 004, which is expected to be even larger and nuclear powered. This betrays obviously the long term strategy of the Chinese Navy. It is obvious that the plan is to develop a naval force capable of confronting the US, the US Navy on its own terms. Large carriers like the American carriers do exist to exert the naval diplomacy control the sea and eventually project power from the sea. This is something that the United States do regularly and it seems that the Chinese are going to play the same game. I'm sure that everybody is hoping that it will stay a game. We have come a long way in these two videos from the Moskva in the 50s to the most modern Indian and Chinese carriers being built and commissioned as we speak. It is clear that the Soviet technology has been the foundation of this de development, even if none of these countries would have chosen to do so, if possible. The very fact of relying on a stobar design defines the capabilities and the use that a navy can do of the carrier, and the capability that are going to be deployed. While the Indians are going to depend from the Russians for a while, the Chinese are rapidly becoming autonomous. While the Indians have designed a strategy tailored on their status of a large regional power, it is clear that the Chinese have a strategy with nearly global ambitions. However, despite how surprising this may be, the roots of both nations' naval air power are in the same place, in Russia. So if you like this video, I am sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could support the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching. Stay safe and see you in the next time.